الحضور الكريم يسرني ان ارحب بالمتحدثين والمشاركين معنا in this conference, uh, the protracted Arab civil wars, uh, the sixth session entitled humanitarian and environmental implications of civil wars. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to remind you of some housekeeping issues. Uh, every intervention for every speaker, we have four speakers. Uh, the, each intervention uh, ought to stretch uh, between 15 minutes and 20 minutes uh, and i hope you would abide by this time those who want to listen to english uh, you can uh, press the icon english uh, on the interpretation icon and those who want to listen to arabic they can press the icon that says spanish and those who want to uh, pose a question from amongst the panelists, uh, they can press uh, the raise hand feature and others, uh, they can uh, write down their questions uh, in the uh, Q&A uh, space, uh, the Q&A icon. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this uh, theme is a complementary theme that uh, relates to the implications of the civil war in the Arab world. If we look at the humanitarian dimension, we become certain that uh, it is perilous, dangerous. Indeed, the environment has been the victim of such uh, civil wars because of the destruction and the impact is protracted, especially the psychological impact as well. I'd like to uh, welcome Mu'taz Al-Fajiri. He's an assistant professor and head of the human rights program at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. He obtained his uh, MA and PhD in law from the School of Oriental and um, African Studies South from the University of London. He was a senior teaching fellow at SOAS and the executive director of Cairo Institute for Human Rights and Studies. His research focuses on humanitarian rights and he has authored a book that is called Islamic Law and Human Rights, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Mr. Muataz will be talking about the humanitarian related implications or consequences of international and regional geopolitics of Arab civil wars time and again. Dr. Mu'taz, 15 to 20 minutes, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Abdel Fattah. I'd like to thank the Arab Center for this invitation and for organizing this conference and designating a session for humanitarian related issues as well as the legal and humanitarian uh, situation on the ground. Since 2011 uh, and up to this moment, uh, over a decade, we can derive certain lessons that uh, relate to the ability of the international order vis-a-vis -vis, uh, such uh, civil wars uh, that uh, infringe on humanitarian law and international law. I'll be focusing on Syria, Yemen, and Libya for a number of considerations. The three cases provide us with a clear picture on the influence of the regional and international powers and the overlap thereby and the implication on the human rights system and its involvement. By and large, the main objective of this paper is to answer the following question, how regional and international competing agendas participated 
in aggravating the humanitarian cost of the three cases, Syria, Libya, and Yemen. Through uh, focusing on uh, the ability of the international law to respond to the requirements of uh, human rights on the ground uh, and understanding the geopolitics uh, between the regional and international powers. So this uh, axis builds upon the previous discussions. However, we shall look about uh, these political struggles and the impact thereby on the humanitarian uh, situation. Here we're talking about internal uh, wars uh, and the increase of civil wars following the Cold War. I think the ability of the international community uh, to deal with such a civil war is the most difficult because of the geopolitics of such wars. We have uh, overlapping interests uh, in the 90s as well uh, as the first decade of the uh, third millennia since uh, the 90s. Uh, we talk here about 80 to 85 percent of the victims being civilians, uh, 41 million IDPs. Uh, and 25 million uh, have become refugees outside their own countries. As far as uh, the urban warfare, in accordance with the Red Cross in 2018, has uh, caused losses eightfold bigger than the ordinary kind of civil war, especially in Iraq and Syria. Uh, the use of uh, starvation tools in this uh, or in these civil wars is a commonplace. Uh, when we talk about uh, the implications of uh, humanitarian rights, uh, I uh, would like to link between the international criminal law, the international law, and the international humanitarian law. Sometimes we forget the international human rights law, because when we look at the Syrian case, some of the crimes do not relate to uh, crimes against humanity. We can talk about uh, extra uh, judicial killings, uh, arbitrary, uh, 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 imprisonment uh, and other crimes that do not relate to such law. However, they do relate to the international humanitarian or international human rights law. As far as the data is concerned, uh, there is a difficulty in accessing the aggregate data because the commissions of inquiries uh, deal with the interviews that uh, they conduct and other kind of nuances. Uh, but as far as uh, the GEE is concerned, uh, that uh, has been established in Yemen, as well as the International Commission of Inquiry in Syria, as well as uh, the other commission that was established uh, to be sent to Libya. There are also the uh, task forces uh, that work for the Security Council, and they are uh, uh, being they have been established to uh, uh, have an oversight role over the uh, uh, criminal systems, uh, as well as uh, the uh, selling of arms and so on and so forth. Uh, we have witnessed uh, a paralysis of uh, some of the mechanisms. Uh, uh, for the last decade uh, because of the geopolitics uh, in our region. I'd like to give you some figures. Uh, I won't uh, 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 take much of your time, but as far as the civilians, since 2011, March, 
up until September 2020, the number is uh, 226,779 civilians who were killed by the Syrian regime and others. The Syrian regime has uh, the responsibility uh, of killing around 88% of them. And in uh, Yemen, since 2014, we have more than 12,000 civilians in accordance with the GGE, the government uh, 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 panel of experts, uh, or perhaps uh, this uh, might uh, have also uh, caused a number of uh, dilemmas, uh, especially as far as uh, uh, arbitrary uh, uh, imprisonment. Uh, and uh, as far as the captives uh, are concerned, we have uh, more than 130,000 uh, prisoners, uh, and some are unaccounted for. I have some observations uh, about the response of the international human rights uh, system vis-a-vis uh, -vis the violations and the crimes uh, that we have fit witnessed in Syria, Yemen, uh, and Libya. Following the Cold War, we had certain coercive mechanisms. Uh, we don't talk here about the military intervention. When we talk about the responsi responsibility to protect, uh, we uh, might straight away think of the military intervention. But uh, there are different mechanisms uh, that uh, I'd like to touch upon. Uh, the like of the arms embargo, uh, leveling sanctions, uh, also the international uh, criminal uh, uh, tools that uh, might uh, uh, play a role as uh, uh, deterrent rule tools. The ICC, for example, might uh, look through a case, uh, but uh, on the ground, uh, nothing would change because there is no international support. Uh, and thus, uh, there are coercive kind of mechanisms uh, that might play a better role. There is also the positive incentives, uh, especially in Libya, following the settlement, we still uh, uh, see a fragility in the ability of the Libyan institutions uh, to curb uh, the uh, crimes rate uh, and the violations. Uh, I, I think that uh, the coercive measures uh, are very important in this uh, uh, domain when the hostilities take place uh, and uh, wide scale violations, uh, we need to resort to the coercive mechanisms. But the international community has a problem when it comes to the uh, uh, early alarms. Uh, we do understand that uh, the civil, that civil wars uh, start uh, uh, kind of uh, in a certain area and then uh, it expands uh, and it aggravates uh, as time goes by. But the international community has a problem uh, when it comes to the early alarm systems. Uh, as far as uh, the Sri Lanka 2009 and Myanmar 2010-2018, the international community had uh, put into place uh, uh, the Charles Petrie investigative uh, committee and the Gert Rosenthal 2019. These two reports are important uh, uh, because we discover that the same errors uh, are repeated in Yemen and in Syria. Here we're talking about uh, the response, the international community's response to the genocide in Rwanda. Uh, we had certain exemptions as far as the ability of the international community to deal with such disasters in East Timor, we had a consensus, but usually we don't. And that's why such uh, struggles are protracted. Following the Myanmar uh, crisis, uh, Human Rights Upfront Initiative in 2014 has been declared uh, for the sake of uh, uh, creating certain changes uh, to curb the human 
rights related violations uh, uh, or implications as well as the early alarm system but unfortunately syria libya and yemen uh, or in such cases we see the recurrence of uh, the same uh, errors uh, we have uh, a number of stakeholders in such cases uh, overlapping of strategic interests uh, uh, convergence or divergence of uh, such interests we, when we have convergence uh, this uh, uh, reflects positively uh, on the human rights uh, in libya for example uh, we can see a case uh, uh, to study uh, indeed uh, we have uh, witnessed uh, uh, certain positive uh, implications unlike uh, yemen and syria the protraction of such civil wars uh, have led to different branches. Yes, we have. You have five minutes, Dr. Mertes. Right, I'll move. Uh, I'll move to talk about uh, the impact of uh, the um, the uh, application or the implementation of the uh, international human rights law and the international humanitarian law. We had witnessed a number of. Uh, spanners uh, uh, thrown in the work uh, but we need to differentiate between the first phase uh, following the arab spring and the uh, 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 siege that has been leveled against uh, the arab spring later on or years later we uh, can shed light on the russian iranian turkish uh, interference in syria we have uh, the coalition uh, forces, uh, 23,000 sorties, uh, more than 8,000 uh, civilians have uh, uh, been killed uh, in accordance with the GGE's report. As far as uh, the implication or the implementation of the international mechanisms, as far as uh, the sanctions system and the arms embargo, the arms embargo in Libya has been violated systematically and there is a bias as far as the sanction system in yemen because it, it has been imposed on the houthis rather than the other parties uh, who are also responsible for atrocities uh, there's also the uh, uh, justice and accountability russia and china has uh, resorted to the veto 18 times since october 2011 especially when it comes to the uh, Syrian dossier, as well as uh, the referral of this dossier to the ICC. Uh, there is also uh, 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 another problem uh, in the uh, Yemeni dossier and uh, the Libyan ones. Uh, as far as uh, the battle that uh, relates to the facts finding missions, uh, uh, there is indeed uh, a number of obstacles uh, uh, that have uh, been encountered by the fact finding mission in Yemen uh, because of the Saudi influence uh, in the HCR, the Human Rights Council. Sorry, could you please uh, wrap up? Yes, in conclusion, I'd like to say that uh, there is a structural uh, uh, loop. There, is this, there are structural loopholes uh, in uh, the ability of uh, 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 protecting uh, the civilians uh, in, during the civil wars, especially the civil wars that relate to uh, uh, divergent uh, uh, interests of certain stakeholders. Uh, the consensus is very important regionally and internationally to curb such implications. Uh, and lastly, the uh, international system uh, uh, plays a role in uh, embarking on setting up certain mechanisms uh, uh, to have uh, certain positive uh, involvements uh, to curb uh, the implications uh, of such civil wars, uh, like uh, setting up uh, fact-finding missions, uh, as well as uh, uh, positive deterrence, uh, uh, arms embargoes, uh, and uh, uh, counter rhetoric uh, uh, of uh, the a main rhetoric uh, that emanate from the civil war so the civilians are facing problems but the system has uh, certain mechanisms on the long run that uh, might be indeed uh, uh, positive thank you thank you dr Mertes, for this uh, intervention
I'm glad to I'm glad to uh, welcome Dr. Muhammad uh, Al Saidi. He is from the Qatar University and has a PhD from Heidelberg, from Germany, and he has published a number of research papers on Yemen, uh, East Africa, Jordan. Mr. Muhammad Al Saidi will have uh, 15 to 20, 20 minutes. He'll be talking about the environmental impacts of uh, Arab civil wars from basic supply uh, destruction to weaponization. And uh, he will uh, provide us with examples from Yemen and Syria and talk about the indirect implications of uh, 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 the conflicts in the Arab world. Please. Thank you very much and peace be upon you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, to participate in this conference uh, that tackles the most important issue. I'd like uh, to talk in English uh, because I've prepared my paper in English. Uh, allow me. Uh... Okay. Um... So welcome to the presentation on the environmental impacts of the Arab civil wars. I will also talk about how the environment itself has also led to wars. I think both um, are uh, important to mention. So here's a, a roadmap through the presentation. I will talk first about the environment conflict links in the Arab war world. I think it goes both ways. Then I'll talk about the environmental factor as a major driver of conflicts, how it is really important to look at the environmental uh, issues all together, uh, how they drive conf conflicts. Then I will talk about the environment, environmental impacts. These are a lot. I will just mention them and then I will go uh, to talk about infrastructure damage and the importance of looking at resilience of societies and what does this mean at the end for uh, development aid and post-conflict rehabilitation. So let me start by um, just mentioning that envir environment, environment and conflicts go together. We have uh, the classical, um, let's say, hypothesis that conflicts cause environmental problems. This is for sure, as we just heard from Dr. Mortez, the uh, conflicts, they lead to humanitarian disasters. They lead to destruction of basic supplies. They lead to destructions of ecosystems. Uh, they lead, of course, to migration. And with this comes uh, a lot of problems with regard to land use and agriculture abandonment. Uh, the absence of state institutions during conflicts and the absence of environmental regulation can have devastating impact. Also, during conflicts, we can have capture of resources, misuse of them, even transboundary ones. This is a big issue now. At the same time, we have really we have to understand that environmental problems they lead to conflicts. Um, I'll talk about it in a minute, but scarcity and degradation lead to local water conflicts. This is the most common environmental conflicts that we face in the Middle East, local water and land use conflicts. Also single environmental disasters, they lead to um, livelihood losses and the long-term environmental damage, such as climate variability, desertification, and so on, they are also causing a lot of problems and expectedly even more conflict, conflicts in the future. A very classical example of this debate is the Syrian war. In academic literature, there's this big debate, did drought cause the Syrian conflict? What we can see from the figure in the left, let me use my pointer here. So what we can see here clearly, we had a historic drought um, before the, the civil war in Syria. It was the most severe drought. And there has been very eminent scientists uh, in environmental public policies that said, okay, th this drought has led to migration and this migration 
uh, led to explosion of, uh, let's say, frustrations, and it led, it caused a conflict. And of course, the other side <laughs> said, no, uh, environmental issues do not cause disintegration or revolutions. And if we look at the magnitude of the drought, it was uneven. Yeah, the migration, it was not as much as we estimated. And generally, um, the environmental factors do not cause, they are not the driver of conflicts. One environmental um, incident such as drought does not lead to revolution. I tend to agree with this. Uh, I think what leads to conflict is policy fa failures with regard to the environment. If you look at Syria, we had since the 1960s, massive expansion of agriculture, price guarantees, the Ba'ath Party uh, policy of self-sufficiency. And now we have a perfect storm of over-exploitation of resources, water scarcity, and also climate variability. The same story can be told to Ye in Yemen, where we have uh, in the 70s protected markets, resource capture and agriculture. And one good example, I think, is the repatriation of the Yemeni Yemenis from the Gulf War in 1991, where we have 1 million Yemenis coming back, a lot coming back to the Sada Basin, also uh, the home region of the Houthis. This basin is near closure. We have many water basins in Yemen are near absolute closure in, Taiz, in, 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 in Sana'a, for example. So this is the same story of the Middle East. The, um, the same story can be told again and again. We have decades of water resources development with active state involvement. The Middle East has become the most dammed region in the, in, in the world. Uh, uh, cheap energy, and after that, what I call a late awakening in the 1990s, where we have increased scarcity, we adopted many new laws, many new uh, policies, but we are still failing on the environmental front. If we look, uh, for example, even in the GCCs, agriculture still uses 70% of the resources, has almost none economic, let's say, very small economic contribution, uh, and the ground water basins are being deployed. The same in uh, Jordan, where we grow bananas, very water intensive, rice is grown in Egypt. Saudi Arabia produces, still produces wheat, although Saudi Arabia reduces a lot of this wheat production. So what, I, what, I would like, what I'm saying here is the environmental factor, the, sustain, the failure with regard to sustainability, tackling sustainability, will and has led to um, increasing conflict likelihood and political disintegration. And if this happens, what are the impacts? The impacts are wide. We have seen in the Middle East issues of weaponization of resources, of dams, of, ag of agriculture land. Uh, we have seen ecosystems damage. There has been an excellent um, uh, reportage in the Arabic um, Al Jazeera online. I've seen it two days ago about um, how the oil, oil spills into groundwater in Yemen, in Shibam and Marab have caused huge health and ecosystem damages. This is a prime example, and you see a lot of these incidents across the Middle East. Um, also, access to basic supply. I will focus on this in the next um, minute. Also, there are other impacts such as um, infrastructure damage. This is unallowed under, under international law, but this is, this, is, this is reality in all conflict cases and also unmanaged resources. This is a huge, I think, neglected problem. So let me talk about this, this aspect, access to basic supply. What we, what we are doing in our research is really to say we have to look at basic supply adaptation to the conflict, not only the damage, but how they adapt. We see conflict as one uh, interruption that is caused by certain uh, disruptions based on a security threat. There are other threats, climate and else. And then the supply systems, they try to adapt both in the hardware and the software parts of them. And this adaptation, they determine post-conflict rehabilitation. 
And we look in our research into the resilience and the variability of these adaptation uh, measures. So why water and electricity? Water and electricity are key for other services. Uh, we have seen it in the case of Yemen. If you do not have electricity, you cannot clear wa clean water. You don't have, uh, uh, let's say, good healthcare system. This lead to cholera, lead to diseases. So they are central services, water and electricity. And we, as I said, we look at hardware and software issues. Um, and we look at the vulnerability at the micro level. So how adaptations, how the reactions of people um, make them more vulnerable or less vulnerable at the macro level. And we, we have looked at the results of this adaptation on the macro level, on the overall resilience of the system. Let me share one exam the example of, uh, of some uh, uh, adaptations that have been happening for example, in South Sudan, people started with the help of donors who have water kiosks. These are, um, let's say, water taps that are run by the utilities that people can go there and get water. This is an excellent example of a good planned adaptation that we looked at that has um, good uh, scoring for resilience, for example. And um, I'll not talk a lot, a lot about it, I'll talk about solar um energy adaptation in Yemen this is community led without the help of the international uh, donors and also the approach of integrated sc school with basic supply in Syria has been very popular and very successful let me dive in into the example of Yemen Yemen the impacts of the war has been devastating you, ha you can see here that the production energy production have been um, 16,000 uh, kiloton of energy equivalent before the war, it is now almost 2,000. What's interesting, people, uh, also the production of oil and gas, people go to solar energy. So solar energy have increased a lot, especially in the residential area. The water situation in Yemen have been very bad before the war. It is now being worse. So this is how people adapt in Yemen. They use solar energy. This is, this is solar energy used for water pumping. These are solar panels that are installed on, on, the top, on the roof of the water utility in Yemen. We have also energy vendors that use diesel uh, in the neighborhoods where you can buy from them if you like. And on almost all roofs in let's say affluent parts of Sana'a, you can see solar uh, systems. Let me... Let me um, uh, talk about the ramification. So we looked at all these adaptations um, and we said what we have to do, we have to rethink infrastructure rehabilitation. This is all these ideas combined of what we think can be an idea for the future where you have locally available resources such as solar energy, such as um, let's say um, uh, rainwater harvesting, you can use this in Yemen, it has been increasing, uh, where you have also integrated schools where you put the school near to the health center and to the agriculture center, where you have mobile water kiosks but are connected to, uh, to the water well and are connected also to the water utility. And these adaptations like in Yemen, they need to be connected to some grid. Um, and they need to have backup storage systems. So this is an idea of community-led, more decentralized infrastructure planning that we think we should consider in the future. So we have to increase the resilience uh, of the of the conflict. What we say it's a conflict resilience. People ability during conflicts to still have basic supply. This is a design feature of the of the water infrastructure. It is enough of. Um, very decentralized system that collapsed um, during the war. We need to use locally available resources and to include community-led adaptations. I have, also, I have still two slides. First, this idea of looking at resilience of infrastructure instead of only looking at the stability of this infrastructure and the reliability. We think it is, a, it is a bigger idea, not only for conflict resilience, but also for countries that do not suffer from conflict. This is a work that we did for the GCC region. And we said, 
uh, here looking at um, the resilience of coastal infrastructure that are large scale uh, vulnerable to many impacts, security from non-state actors, um, but also climate and also planning and uh, many other risks. This is really important to incorporate in our uh, management of infrastructure. So this is really important for the wider region. So let me conclude. What I have argued is the environment uh, conflict nexus, uh, nexus goes both way. It's a nexus. Uh, and it dates back to the 1960s, to the green revolutions that we had in the Middle East, to the uh, yeah, not sustainable policies that we had, especially in the agriculture se sector. And they argued that environmental policy failures will drive uh, disintegration and in instability and conflicts, armed conflicts will just accelerate this and add new, let's say, incidents of damage. Um, I have also said that basic uh, supply infrastructure cause a lot of conflicts, uh, other problems. So we cannot really separate impacts of environmental impacts of conflicts from other impacts such as health and such as economic impacts. I propose that we should look at conflict resilience in protect, uh, protracted conflicts because these conflicts will, will, will last for maybe many decades. We need to experiment and redesign the infrastructure. Uh, we need to improve the community role in the interventions. And we need at the same time, and this is important, we have been talking about this for a long time, we need to link development aid or humanitarian aid to long-term development. Because we, if, if we reconstruct uh, and provide aid in the same ways in the context of protracted complex, prolonged complex, things will get destro destroyed again and again. That's it from my side. Thank you a lot. And I hope uh, we can discuss later. شكراً شكراً جزيلاً عزيزي دكتور محمد السعيدي على هذه المداخلة القيمة ولا شك يعني ما أثرته من من قضايا وأمور تتعلق بهذا الترابط النكسس بين البيئة والنزاع في غاية الأهمية وبخاصة في المنطقة العربية والنزاعات التي شهدناها. It seems that you have also saved us some minutes because you abided greatly by the time. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome Dr. Musa Alaya. He's an assistant professor of the Public Administration Program at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies and the editorial manager of the Hakama Journal of public administration and public policy. He holds a PhD in international development administration and peace building from Leiden University in the Netherlands. He's a specialist in international development, peace building and conflict studies. The gentleman will be talking about humanitarian and environmental data and the implications. In the case of Yemen, and he'll be focusing on the problems related to the mis- or the, the, the misuse of such resources and uh, uh, the floor is yours sir you have 20 minutes thank you dr abdel fattah i'd like to thank uh, mohammed saidi he uh, saved us some time perhaps uh, i would confiscate this time and use it uh, as an extra time in my uh, uh, presentation, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, conference, the Arab Center. This conference has been uh, splendid, and uh, uh, I'd like to share with you uh, the following. I wanted to talk about the environment, albeit it is not my speciality, but Dr. Muhammad has uh, shot all the foxes. And uh, uh, so perhaps 
I'll be focusing then on three uh, studies uh, and uh, a major uh, project, uh, the database of war in the Arab world uh, since 1960 up until 2019, uh, with a special focus on uh, the humanitarian situation in Yemen. I had a paper that has been published uh, on the economy of war in Yemen. Uh, and uh, there is also a book that includes a number of uh, studies and uh, statistics and struggle patterns uh, in Yemen and in other countries. And you can see on the screen, uh, this is the first the perception of uh, the database. And uh, this project has been submitted to the Arab Center, to the Doha Institute, in order for the Institute to adopt it and to have into place a database to differentiate between the civil wars uh, statistic, statistically, uh, taking into consideration that the statistics are somewhat conflicting in certain studies. Uh, as far as uh, my research is concerned, uh, I have started to focus on the database uh, and the patterns and the implications of the Arab world struggles or conflicts in three phases. The first, what we call the quasi-conventional and conventional wars, 1962 up until 2000, and the so-called war on terror, 2011, 2001 up until 2010, and the US war. And uh, the Manukanian kind of uh, strategy of Bush, you are with us or against us. The third uh, phase is uh, the Arab Spring uh, phase from 2011 up until 2019. And I focused on the overlap between these uh, phases because the conventional war has perhaps bigoted uh, the war on terrorism. Uh, especially in the post-colonial era, where the post-colonial era had led to a number of wars uh, and the emergence of a number of uh, extremist or the so-called extremist uh, groups. Uh, then we delved into the second stage or the second phase, uh, the war on terror. And the war on terror has uh, uh, led to uh, police states, uh, repressive regimes, uh, autocracies, uh, and this has led to the disgruntlement of the populace, which had led to the Arab Spring, and the Arab Spring is a normal reaction uh, against uh, the police policies uh, and the repressive policies of the Arab states. So these uh, phases are linked to each other. and. Uh, this was the uh, cornerstone uh, to have into place uh, the database. Then we focused on the uh, uh, types of uh, conflicts, uh, the conflicts between states or the interstates, uh, the interstates uh, uh, conflicts and the non-state actors uh, uh, wars as well, which are numerous. In addition to that, we focused on the implications, uh, the losses, uh, psychological uh, losses, as well as uh, the losses uh, amongst uh, uh, humans. Uh, and uh, I've noticed that uh, the statistics uh, that I have uh, presented perhaps are not accurate 100 percent uh, because I relied on a number of uh, unfinished kind of uh, business or unfinished kind of uh, uh, studies. Uh, so there are no accurate numbers because up to this moment, we don't have a strategic Arab project that these was such a database. We are uh, trying to uh, liaise with certain institutions uh, to fund this project and adopt it in order to better it. Uh, uh, also, 
We have uh, focused on uh, the Arab Spring third stage patterns uh, that are unprecedented, uh, and there are five. The first is uh, the spread of the banned arms as well as the chemical weapons. They were there in Iraq and in other countries, but in the third stage, uh, these weapons have uh, disseminated also the starvation or the famine and uh, mortality amongst children uh, in addition to migration as well as uh, coercive uh, displacement uh, and uh, internal displacements, uh, extracurricular extra uh, killings. Uh, uh, and uh, as the gentleman said, uh, child recruitment uh, and their abuse and using them as uh, a war policy. These are five kind of uh, patterns uh, that we have uh, witnessed, uh, but we need to uh, stifle through the documents uh, uh, and the studies in order to refine them. I have also discovered uh, that uh, uh, these kind of uh, uh, issues are not there in a number of databases. I have here 17 databases that include uh, uh, information, but uh, are conflicting, uh, ambiguous, uh, vague, and uh, do not cover all the Arab world. So the Arab Civil War database is a very important uh, project in order to uncover the truth and put uh, correct and accurate statistics uh, to uh, get to the truth, or perhaps quasi-truth. Throughout my study, I have found, as I said, uh, that uh, there are uh, certain information that are incomplete uh, and uh, the unilateral, unilateral sources uh, that some depend on, and this is wrong. Uh, we need to look at different sources and different uh, resources in order to focus on certain uh, information that are uh, issued uh, on the part of certain institutions and certain international uh, bodies, uh, UN international bodies and others. And I have tried my best uh, to get to the bottom of it. And uh, throughout one year, I tried to collect evidence uh, before joining the Arab uh, uh, center. I was in Raudbout in the Netherlands and I worked up upon this, uh, I worked on this project uh, for a year. But unfortunately, I found loopholes and I found that uh, uh, a number of databases uh, include uh, problems that relate to timing uh, as well as uh, uh, covering some uh, civil wars rather than all. Uh, loopholes also and shortcomings uh, in uh, the number of casualties, uh, uh, the killed uh, persons uh, or civilians, uh, and uh, some uh, discrepancies in the timelines, uh, and the, for example, the issue of women. Uh, sometimes they talk about uh, women and their participation in conflict, but they do not uh, uh, plumb the depth of uh, women's participation, as well as uh, the number of victims amongst the women and children and so on and so forth. Uh, and these databases uh, that uh, our researchers depend on are incomplete and we cannot depend on uh, uh, in uh, our work. So the Arab Civil Wars database is an idea that uh, should take into consideration the period stretching from 1960 up to, to 1219. And we hope that uh, we would get to our objective uh, in order for other researchers to, bu to build upon what we've achieved. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I've noticed that there are certain ambiguous uh, 
issues. Some uh, people try to look at the conflict from a narrow kind of perspective. Uh, there are and there are number there, there is a number of dimensions uh, that are missing. Uh, Opsala's definition of the database uh, uh, talks about 25 killed uh, and plus 25 that might uh, resemble uh, a civil war. But in Yemen, since uh, 1995 up to 2010, we have uh, 45,000 killed amongst the tribes in Yemen. Uh, there's also there are also wars in uh, uh, tribal areas in Sudan, in Egypt, uh, in uh, Upper Egypt, uh, and uh, in uh, uh, certain conflicts. Uh, more than 25 people uh, are killed, uh, and this is uh, a common place uh, in a number of uh, skirmishes uh, in some of the Arab world. So how? come we say that uh, the civil war can be defined as a civil war when 25 people are killed or more. In addition to terrorism, uh, terrorism also is, uh, the definition of terrorism is ambiguous. Uh, there is no unified definition of terrorism and thus uh, we see the war on terrorism and uh, the ideology thereby uh, and if it's used in the western databases uh, we might uh, see that uh, there is uh, a governing state uh, that uh, terrorizes its people but uh, nobody but an island uh, for what takes place in certain countries. So how come certain groups are designated as terrorist groups and some states that uh, resort to terrorism is not Hamas in a number of databases is described as terrorist organization. And, but uh, a number of countries uh, believe that uh, it is a resistant uh, force so that's why we need to unify the uh, conceptions and the definitions uh, under one umbrella. In the Arab world, uh, the pace of uh, conflicts uh, is to the tune of 101 up until 2019. In Yemen, we had 11 wars, uh, 1.8 wars a year. And uh, uh, some of these wars uh, uh, went on for five years. In Yemen, uh, the national dialogue uh, uh, did constitute uh, a break that would be flared again in the north, on the south, uh, and then uh, in uh, uh, a number of our other areas. Uh, Dr. Musa, you've got five minutes left. Yes, please give me five minutes because the, the, the theme is important. And uh, Mohammed Saeed is a Yemeni, so he gave me some of his time. <laughs> anyway, there are a number of statistics uh, about the nature of uh, struggle in the Yemen. Uh, in the Arab world, uh, the uh, total aggregate of the time of war is 18 months, uh, save the Iraqi-Iranian war. Also, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait took only two days. So the rate here is uh, is different. Uh, as far as the second and third phase, uh, we cannot uh, uh, have into place uh, rates or medians uh, because uh, the these stages are still going on. They are protracted uh, on and off. Uh, and that's uh, why we cannot uh, 
a calculate a rate. As far as the human losses, we can see that in 1980 up to 1988, we had 700,000 killed during the Iran-Iraq war. In Sudan, in Somalia, uh, there were also a number of uh, people who were killed and uh, numerous casualties. Uh, the Harvard Research Group uh, said that uh, uh, we uh, cannot count uh, the human losses uh, in wars uh, because 80 percent of uh, the human losses uh, are not counted. This study has uh, had 13 countries uh, uh, as a sample. And some say that every counted case has five uncounted cases, let alone the indirect casualties of the wars. So the statistics vary. As far as the total number of victims in the Arab Spring, the number is 865,410 in Syria and 148,000 in uh, Iraq. Yemen is a closed kind of country and uh, uh, there are no genuine reports uh, and uh, a number of NGOs are banned from going there or it is difficult to get to certain uh, certain areas so the number in Yemen is 67,000 but perhaps the number the genuine number is 220,000 some uh, battles uh, claim 800 casualties a day could you wrap up uh, Dr. Musa please As far as the economic uh, uh, implications and the economic catastrophe in the Arab world, the expenditure in the Arab world in 2020 uh, was to the tune of $180 billion. Uh, in Benghazi, the number is $7 billion, but Yemen necessitates $62 billion. Uh, also, the expenditure on uh, arms is huge. As far as uh, the losses in Yemen, economic-wise, it is to the tune of $750 billion, in addition to uh, other amounts uh, that relate to restructuring efforts and uh, other efforts. Saleh, during his tenure, over 30 years, uh, estimates say that he had 32 to 60 billion dollars, 32 to 60 billion dollars uh, in 20 different countries. Uh, the war economy was to the tune of 14 billion dollars. Uh, and uh, in the south, uh, the South had received billion of dollars because it occupied the central bank in the South. And also the customs and the taxes and other kind of sources from different merchants and who uh, support uh, the Southern Transitional Council, and uh, indeed, uh, uh, here we're talking about billions of dollars. The time is up, uh, Dr. Musa. Just one minute, please. The last slide. The Houthis also uh, uh, have derived benefit from the war. The Houthis took from the monetary reserve uh, 5.1 billion dollars uh, by way of uh, revenues uh, in Sana'a and also it has 1.7 billion dollars uh, from 
taxes, uh, revenues. Also, companies, hospitals, and merchants uh, and uh, plants uh, do pay kickbacks for the Houthis. Uh, also, the Yemeni diaspora pays for the Houthis in accordance to Zakari and Robinson. They also steal 70% of the humanitarian aid. The Hadi government, the Al Qaeda, and the other non state actors also loot and steal 70% of the aid. In addition to that, the black market amounts to $1.14 billion annually. Ohadi and the parties in Ma'rib and in other areas in Yemen, they do uh, have the war economy that is very lucrative. There is a secret uh, kind of uh, agreement between the warring parties to share the cake of uh, Yemen, especially the raw oil revenues. Uh, so, there is a consensus, as I said, amongst the warring parties to benefit from oil and gas revenues, and indeed, uh, uh, this resource or these resources feed uh, such warring parties, and also there are smuggled uh, commodities uh, that. Uh, go through uh, countries that have participated in the war in Yemen, the Emirates, Oman, uh, using forged documents. Uh, the commodities get to the Hodeida uh, port. Uh, there, are a num there, are, there, is a num there is a number of uh, 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 conflict-related uh, patterns, uh, but I'll just skip them because the time is up. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Mr. Musa, for this uh, 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 intervention. And uh, I'll move to Thomas Dombrovsky. He's a, a PhD holder from Yale, in the United States of America, and his research focus on democracy and constitution. He'll be talking about sharing and trading refugees, Syrian civil war as a new impetus for reconfiguring international refugee law. Dr. Thomas, 15 to 20 minutes. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Abdel Fatak, uh, and uh, thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure, and it was a wonderful conference so far. Um, so without far ado, uh, let me um, uh, start with my introduction. Uh, the scale of uh, refugee crisis caused by the uh, Syrian civil war revived the interest in designing a refugee sharing scheme with two general objectives in mind justice for refugees and justice between states. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to inquire into at least some of the parameters of such sharing scheme in light of the empirical data produced by the Syrian refugee crisis and the European Union's experience with its common asylum system and refugee sharing scheme. What all academic proposals have in common is that any practical uh, solution need combining um, uh, quotas with mechanisms uh, for their trading. At the same time, it must preserve the legal and underlying ethical principles on which the international refugee law stands and which were reaffirmed unanimously by states in the New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants in 2016, that is after this influx, uh, refugee influx uh, to Europe. Um, So I will proceed in the following way. First, I will review the empirical data 
uh, to establish what the parameters of sharing and trading scheme need to address. Second, I assess the legal constraints for devising such scheme. And finally, I will try to highlight some uh, of the necessary parameters of and basic guidelines for such sharing and trading uh, mechanism. So first, the empirics uh, of the uh, Syrian refugee crisis and its impact on political environment of leading international norm setting states. The number of forcibly displaced people worldwide might soon be reaching 100 million with the recent events in Afghanistan. The number was 40 million, as you can see on uh, this chart on the left. 40% of those forced to leave their homes because of an armed conflict originates from the Arab region. As of March of 2020, the Syrian civil war itself forced 6.6 million people to seek refugee status abroad, and there were 2.6 million registered Afghan refugees and almost 5 million Palestinian refugees. Other pro protracted civil wars at the region's borders are adding to the numbers. Now, where the million, these millions of people go. 73% of all refugees are hosted in neighboring countries. Only some 10% of all refugees lived in the European Union at the end of, 19, of 2019. This equals to 0.6% of Europeans Union, uh, European Union's total population. In contrast, Lebanon's shares, share of refugees compared to its total population is 13%. 0.4%, in Jordan it is 6.4%, in Turkey 43%. So is 0.6 of its total population too many refugees for one of the three uh, world's leading economies? Economically not, politically yes. The explanation lies in a broader process of public discourse transformation between 1990s and today which can be, from the perspective of this paper, seen as a transformation from rights-based politics into uh, identity-based politics. The radicalization of European politics and Western politics in general, both on the right and on the left, is more directly connected to the financial crisis and the euro crisis, which seem to definitely seal the post-war Christian social democratic consensus and initiated substantial reconfiguration of party systems, even if in some countries this has been taking place within the traditional parties themselves. The sudden influx of some 1.3 million refugees, most of them Syrians and Afghans, in 2015 has driven the preferences for populist and driving parties up, embracing nationalism and xenophobia alongside religious, racial, sexual and other uh, bigotries forcing in turn the centrist and leftist parties to adapt their position on migration to the new normal if they wanted to survive. Finally, the COVID pandemic- so, Sorry, Dr. Thomas, just for the uh, translators, can you raise your voice a little bit? Because they yeah. cannot hear you, so they cannot translate. I'm sorry, okay. Um, so finally, the COVID pandemic normalized the solutions previously unimaginable. In case of Europe, the exemptions from free movement provided by the EU law based on public order were abused during the immigration crisis. And with the pandemic, border closures and border controls became commonplace on the grounds of public health exemptions with little oversight due to the state of emergency. This externalization of the Syrian crisis went to the core of the ongoing value transformation in the Western world. It is worse to juxtapose what happened after 2015 with the preceding decade when the war on terror was already in full progress. In sharp contrast to the situation today, the first decade of the 21st century was marked by renewed interest of constitutional and international law scholarship in advancing Kantian concept on the right of universal hospitality into a bigger system of uh, cosmopolitan rights. Also public opinion polls in Europe were indicating a turn regarding to Euro Europeans' attitudes towards immigration between 2002 and 2014. Not a dramatic change, uh, but at least uh, the stop of negative trend caused by the war in former Yugoslavia. 
The immigration from Islamic countries has become increasingly conflated in public discourse with the increase of crime rates, with no data to back it, higher probability of terrorism. In fact, two thirds of those who committed terrorist attacks in Europe were European citizens, uh, and the majority of others were legal residents, and some kind of a general threat to Europe, uh, Europe civilization and its way of life, whatever it means, uh, if it means anything at all. So in the European Union, besides the hysteric reactions of some countries to the redistribution of refugees from Greece and Italy in 2015, the common asylum system itself become, became quite uh, fragmented. This has been evidenced on the ground by highly varying recognition rates, as you could see on the chart, that is uh, how many percent of asylum application is approved from country uh, to country within the European Union, which points to arbitrariness of standards. National courts rulings suspending intra-EU refugee transfers on account of indirect refoulement, that is the suspension of transfers to member states where an asylum seeker would unfairly be denied international protection and would face removal to his of her or her uh, country of origin is another indicator of this fragmentation. Most of such decisions came from French courts, but also from uh, regional courts. What is interesting Thing is the list of countries that the French courts considered risky for refugees at times. That includes Germany, Austria, Belgium, Sweden, Finland, Italy, and Norway. The following example is telling. While the French administrative court of Bordeaux ruled in 2018 against an Afghan asylum applicant's transfer to Germany on account of indirect refoulement, the German administrative court of Saarland ruled the same year against another Afghan asylum applicant's transfer to Sweden for the same reason. In other words, saying that it is safer for the Afghan refugee to remain in Germany, something that the French court obviously did not think in the other case. The structure of recognition rates regarding the applicant's country of origin also explains the intensifying of the EU state search for outsourcing their refugee convention obligations. While in 2017, the EU-wide recognition rate for South Sudanese was 60% and Iraqis 56.7%, for Syrian refugees, it was over 94% and for Yemenis, over 93%. Most likely, the recognition rate for Afghan refugees in 2022 will be close to 100%, uh, percent, whereas in 2017, it was below 50%. That means that the refugees from these two countries, which account for some 40% of asylum applicants in the EU, will almost all be granted asylum in the EU. In other words, some of the Arab conflicts, despite the intra-EU variation in the recognition rates, leave little space for creativity in the application of the Refugee Convention. And consequently, the only policy available for EU states is to prevent applications being filed in the EU. And this brings us to uh, an outsourcing policy. The bilateral agreement between Australia and Papua New Guinea agreed to after the Austrian High Court struck down a similar agreement or arrangement with Malaysia is the most infamous example of outsourcing policy. The agreement allowed Australia to place asylum seekers into processing or rather detention centers on foreign territory, while the Papua New Guinea Supreme Court declared the agreement unconstitutional, the High Court of Australia repeatedly upheld its legality. At the same time, Australia settled a multi-million dollar claim of ill-treated asylum seekers in those detention centers. As the situation became untenable at the international stage, Australian government, instead of adhering to its obligations under the Refugee Convention, made an agreement with the Obama administration in 2016 to resettle the refugees in the United States. This brings us to the next danger that the outsourcing uh, policy creates, as exemplified by the EU-Turkey deal of 2016, which was strongly criticized by human rights organizations. The deal required that irregular migrants crossing from Turkey to the Greek islands would be returned to Turkey and Turkey would take steps to prevent new migratory routes from opening. The EU in exchange agreed to disburse 6 billion euro to Turkey 
which was fulfilled. And on the bright side, most of the funds went to the refugee serving organization rather than to government's accounts. Uh, second, for every Syrian being returned to Turkey from the Greek islands, another Syrian was to be resettled uh, to the European Union. From March 2016 to March 2021, slightly more than 28,000 Syrian refugees were resettled in the European Union from Turkey, far short of maximum 72,000 outlined in the deal. And the EU also agreed to reinstate this after the regime for Turks, update custom union and re-energize accession talks. The deal worked- Victor Thomas, uh, five minutes you have. Yes, the deal worked uh, in fact very well for the EU from a political perspective. At the same time, the refugee numbers have increased inside Turkey and the reforms uh, to the European asylum system have not materialized in face of anti-immigration attitudes on the rise, as I have described earlier. In other words, keeping the refugees in Turkey has become ever more important for the EU and Turkey's leverage significantly increased uh, as uh, Turkey made quite clear last year what would happen when it led the refugees to pass through to the Greek uh, borders. In sake of its political survival, the EU is likely to resign any criticism of the country regime from democracy and human rights point of view, nor it may definitely effectively demand adequate treatment and living conditions of refugees in Turkey, a part of uh, flowing more money there. The political convenience of the EU-Turkey deal has transformed this outsourcing policy into the main instrument for dealing with refugee issue. An EU Commission proposal announced this year sets aside 3.5 billion for Turkey and additional 2.2 billion is earmarked for Jordan and Lebanon. The EU also intends to establish similar arrangement with Tunisia and Libya. Uh, so now- uh, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Yes. Thomas, excuse me. Can you be more closer the, to the computer a little bit or you can use a headset? Because there is a problem with the translator. Okay, um, I will. I will try to speak speak up. Or um... okay, so maybe maybe now it will be. Um... Yeah, I, I think now it's better. Okay. Go ahead and keep you close to the computer, please. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so the refugee convention does not require a person to claim asylum in the first safe country. Uh, they reach disregarding whether the, he entered another country illegal. The principle of non refoulement prohibits closing borders to refugees. That's the law. What is the problem? Uh, the first problem is that it's not the economy, it's the identity politics, right? So from any uh, rational point of view, accommodating refugees amounting to 0.6% of the country total population, such as the EU, is not a problem. Um, instead, it's uh, the identity politics, and this affects the parameters of a refugee sharing scheme. The second problem is economic migrants versus refugees. Um, I will try to uh, condense uh, the rest of my presentation to keep in time. Uh, so here just uh, to say basically that the EU-wide recognition rate for Syrian refugees is steadily around 94%. That means that the Syrian crisis is a clear-cut example of a situation that falls under the refugee convention and it's not an economic uh, migration. Uh, furthermore, um, um, or these two deals between Australia and Papua New Guinea and EU Turkey deal is based, uh, like a leading rationale is to deter asylum seekers from arriving uh, to uh, the EU um, or to Australia. However, uh, such rationale is illegal uh, if uh, the, uh, this recognition rates indicates clearly uh, that uh, these people are refugees, not uh, economic migrants. Furthermore, it doesn't work in practice. One more million Syrians arrived to Turkey after the 2016 uh, deal. Um, so let me go straight to, um, to the parameters. Um, uh, you know, so what, what we uh, established so far is that there is already an extensive refugee trading scheme through the outsourcing, but there is missing or unworking sharing scheme. So the ethically more problematic training part of a sharing and training scheme seem to be just working just fine in the real world. However, this unregulated trade with international obligations is detrimental to major stakeholders, refugees, and states. 
uh, for refugees, uh, it's clear. Um, I, I ind indicated the consequences. For states, uh, the deals uh, also indicate what are the problems. So states in weaker position are pushing to legally dubious policies. Western states as major international human rights norms setters weakens their pressure on refugee hosting states regarding other issues of human rights, free speech, uh, media, freedom, free political competition, and so on. And also, uh, there is some kind of very irresponsible reliance that the refugee sources will remain far from Western states, uh, which uh, the case of Yugoslavia, um, uh, you know, refute. Uh, same thing can easily happen with Ukraine or Belarus any time. Can, can you make, Dr. Thomas, your concluding remarks in the coming yes. few days? So I will conclude uh, just with few of the uh, parameters. Um, so how could such a scheme look like? Uh, let's first look at the quota uh, or sharing component. I suggest that each country, except the countries with alert status based on the fragile state index, which would exclude some 27 countries, according to the 2021 data, will be allocated refugee quotas. The twin objective of achieving justice for refugees and justice for states require not only to focus on how many refugees a state can economically afford, but also where a refugee can strive bearing again in mind that half of all refugees are children. For instance, we may use as a such basis uh, the Human Development Index, which, com which is composed of adjusted gross national income per capita, education index, and life expectancy index. The original distribution, as I said, is accidental. So when the proportion of refugees in a country reaches certain thresholds, say 1%, this will trigger an immediate redistribution based on the placement key um, um, uh, that is even before the processing of asylum application is concluded. Processing of asylum application would need to be centralized at the UN Refugee Agency alongside the distribution and observance of quotas trading rule. Time limits for processing of application will be sent and if not adhered to, uh, the refugee statute will be considered granted. And also a common judicial control mechanism would have to be instituted. Uh, for uh, you know, further um, uh, rules uh, regarding the placement, we can start with the vulnerability screening tool. Um, and um, I will skip this part and just go to my last slide regarding, uh, the, uh, regarding the training component. So in order to reinstate the primacy uh, or primary obligation of states to provide asylum to refugees, a country can trade only a portion of its quota. However, this means to be substantial enough, substantial enough to realistically nudge states to participate in the scheme, which of course would require a multilateral treaty. So for instance, 70% of quota can be traded. Incentives against trading will be instead built in the trading cost. At the same time, there must be a limit in recipient countries. This should be constructed as double criteria. No country can host more refugees than three times its allocated quota, who at the same time do, uh, do not exceed 1% of the recipient country's total population. The value of the quota will be based on the average annual cost for hosting refugees in that country. The recipient the recipient country will receive up to double the amount calculated as the cost for hosting a refugee in that country if there is such difference. The rest, if any, will go into a common fund that in turn will cover the cost for hosting refugee beyond the allocated quota. In other words, if Germany accepts more refugees than it is its quota, the expenses for these additional refugees will be paid from the common fund instead of a Germany taxpayer money. At the same time, lower income countries would not be incentivized to host refugees for economic reason. I think I uh, might conclude here and uh, leave rest for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thomas, for this valuable uh, presentation and uh, valuable intervention. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thank all the speakers for their valuable interventions. I will move now to some questions which I have received through the application here, and I will now pose these questions, and maybe we can go to the first question, which is from Jamal Gumjum. 
does the speaker agree with the saying that the best way to finish the plight of uh, refugees is to determine the real reason and the root causes and dealing with them instead of looking for parties which are supposed to play a role in accepting these refugees. Kalam Mustafa, maybe this is a question to Dr. Thomas. Maybe there is another question. What are the real solutions for bypassing these conflicts? Are there instant solutions which show that there will be breakthroughs or will the situation remain out there, Mr. Abu Bakr Khalil? The third question, are the current situations are the consequences of uh, international relations? A question in English. A lot of policies and factors on the part of Western and even internal countries that contributed to this case. Is it possible to get out of it through a clear and effective plan? And how long can it take? Uh, now, Dr. Thomas can start responding with the first, to the first question, then we move to other questions. Hmm. Ah, okay, so um, as far as I understood, um, as far as I understood, the question is um, whether it is, uh, you know, better not to try to solve the causes uh, instead of focusing on the uh, refugee issue. I mean, uh, of course it is. Uh, I, but this is a phenomenon which we need to address as well. So I was focusing in my talk on, on this part. Um, but in any case, what I wanted to emphasize is that uh, we, cannot, uh, we, we cannot proceed in the policy building from the point of view of international law by saying, uh, you know, we, we try to keep those people. I mean, if they, if they leave and if they reach our borders, according to international law, we must let them in, we must process the asylum applications. And uh, uh, also uh, they don't need to stay in the first uh, uh, safe country, right? So there are some obligations in the refugee um, uh, convention uh, uh, where, uh, you know, if you illegally enter the country, you need to uh, you need to announce yourself to the authorities. Uh, but there are no um, consequences for the refugees. So if they pass Turkey and come to the European Union, the European Union cannot close the borders. Uh, Hungary cannot build the the the, uh, uh, the fence on the southern borders, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, in order to and and the response of the Western states. Uh, is, the, is the same case for United States regarding the uh, um, influx of uh, refugees from Latin America, uh, you know, entering into deals with, uh, with, uh, with Mexico, the same for Australia, uh, and the same for the European Union. Uh, the prevalent, uh, prevailing policy today is uh, to sh shut the borders um, and uh, ask the buffer states basically uh, to keep the refugees uh, there and this is uh, very legally uh, dubious. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thomas. Are there any responses from Dr. Martez? Yes, there are two questions concerning the international system. Uh, the hum Humanitarian system is embedded in the international system. And in case of the civil war that we talked about, uh, there have been cases which impacted these issues uh, in, uh, directly, including that includes the divisions between the Western powers like over Libya between France and uh, uh, the UK and uh, Italy, uh, also the, the way these powers dealt with the different conflicts and the way European countries dealt with the question of refugees. Also the challenge faced 
by the international. We know the Trump administration has withdrawn altogether from the uh, Human Rights uh, Council. So therefore, these major countries have had, they have a role to play. And also we're talking about regional powers. There is, uh, in, in, in the region, there are also conflict and uh, there, there is a, a polarity and between different countries. And uh, also there was, uh, talk of humanitarian responses facing terrorism. For example, Russia in the Syria, in, in Syria raises the banner of uh, fighting terrorism, for example, when they intervene. Thank you, Dr. Motas. I think we have some time. So maybe one of the questions relating to the themes and have humanitarian impacts. We saw in the two Gulf Wars and the impact it has, how this was had on the environment and the spillage of oil into the waters of the Gulf and the impact that had on the fishing sector, also the impact on uh, the cancer uh, disease and, and the people who suffered some of the weapons tried were highly dangerous. When it comes to weapons, when we're talking about cluster bombs, etc., and even mines, which remained scattered for decades, these are all uh, consequential. They leave their impact on the environment, on the people. Also, the international powers who have interfered, Russia, for example, reports say that Russia tried many weapon systems in Syria. To what extent can the international law hold these countries accountable, for example, for testing this kind of very lethal weapons. I agree with Dr. Martez that the problematic issue of the war on terror and the impact it has had on the humanitarian questions and also the refugee who escapes terrorism is uh, or can be accused of being extremist and all of the impact of that on the identity politi politics and the rise of uh, the far right in some countries we have also the afghan afghanistan uh, crisis and the refugees from there will have an impact. If the panelists have any interventions to make, Dr. Musa, if you have anything, Dr. Mohammed Saidi, the floor is open to you if you want to comment on the points raised by the questioners or on the discussion in general. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdul Fattah. Uh, talking about the major causes for wars and how this can be tackled, I think this is the $100 million question that we may not be able to understand. But uh, we see that those who are in the position of judging when it comes to international law, we'll find that they are themselves accused of violations of human rights. And also some of the conflicts which are looked at as civil wars are in fact, they are not internal conflicts as much as they are proxy wars.
تظل هذه الصراعات ومحركات خارجي وانتهاكات كبيرة جدا وأصبحت أيضا كما تحدثت أن الساحة العربية أيضا ساحة تجارب الأسلحة الجديدة نحن نتكلم عن القنابل العنقودية في اليمن استخدمت بشكل, بشكل رهيب جدا أيضا الغام الممنوعة ضد الأفراد التي هي محرمة الآن دوليا لدينا حوالي 250 ألف معاق في اليمن ما بين إعاقة جزئية وإعاقة كلية عندنا من الأطفال والنساء يعني شوف أنه هناك يعني مضاعفات الأجيال كبيرة جدا استخدموا أيضا في ظل أنماط صراعية صدرت أيضا من دول إقليمي مجاورة وصدرت إلى سوريا واليمن في استخدام الأطفال سواء كان في 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 الحرب نفسه وتم جلب آلاف الأطفال فقط حوالي ثمانية ألف طفل تم جلبهم من أفغانستان إلى سوريا عن طريق ما يسمى جيش فاطمة بواسطة إيران يعني فهناك أنماط كثيرة وليس تجارب في الأسلحة بل الأنماط الصراعية نفسها الجديدة هي أنماط مخزية بشكل قوي جدا فكان هناك مجموعة من السلايدز الذي كنت يعني أود أن أعرضها تعرض هذه هذه الأنماط الجديدة وبكل تفاصيل مختلفة وأرقام يعني مفجعة جدا يعني في في سوريا حوالي 500 ألف معاق بسبب استخدام الأسلحة المختلفة هناك هناك استخدام كيماوي كيماوي ل يعني الأسلحة جديدة في 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 سوريا في ليبيا في اليمن وكلها تؤدي إلى مجازر بشرية قوية وأصبحنا يعني ساحة كبيرة لاستخدام الأسلحة الجديدة أو تجربتها وفي نفس الوقت ظهور أنماط صراعية ليست متفقة مع التركيبة المجتمعية والإسلامية في المنطقة العربية أو العادات والتقاليد وفي نفس الوقت يعني أتت بشكل كبير استخدامات الأطفال الجنسية في الحروب واستخداماتهم في عملية الاستخبارات ونقل المعلومات وجلب المياه والأطعمة كلها يعني ليست متوافقة بشكل كبير جدا في إطار الساحة العربية نحن الآن نعيش في مرحلة انحطاط كبيرة جدا كانت الحروب التقليدية لو شفناها يعني في في الخسائر البشرية برغم أنه عدد الحروب كبيرة جدا في المرحلة الأولى من عام 1960 إلى عام 2000 كانت نسبة الخسائر البشرية أقل بكثير جدا لاستبعدنا القضية الإيرانية الحرب الإيرانية العراقية ليست يعني لا تعادل في حدود عشرة إلى عشرين في المئة من الخسائر في المرحلة الثالثة. شكرا جزيلا. مرحلة كبيرة جدا يعني. شكرا يعني جزيلا دكتور موسى. شكرا, شكرا جزيلا. لدي مداخلتين دكتور محمد السعيدي ودكتور مهند أيضا. تفضل دكتور محمد. شكرا دكتور عبد الفتاح. بشكل بسيط عشان أترك المجال دكتور مهند والآخرين لطرح أسئلة أكثر. بالنسبة للنقطة المتعلقة بمسببات يعني الحروب والأزمة أنا عاوز أوصفها أكثر بأنه نوع من الانحلال في أو أو التفكك في الوطن العربي وهذا التفكك أسبابه ليست من وجهة نظري هي أسباب تنموية هي أسباب تعود زي ما حاولت أشرح بالنسبة للجانب البيئي أنها تعود إلى فشل في الجانب التنموي إذا مثلا شفنا تكلم عليه الدكتور موسى الحروب الداخليه بين القبائل مثلا في اليمن اللي بتقضي على عدد من الناس اللي اكثر من الحروب الاخرى وهذه بتزداد هذه هي حروب عن على الارض عاده والارض هو مرتبط بوجود الماء فكل ما يعني حصل شح في الماء كل ما فشلنا في 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 الجانب التنموي في مواجهه المس ال 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 القضايا التنموية الكبرى زيادة عدد السكان عدم وجود نمو اقتصادي حقيقي مواجهة التغير المناخي هذا الفشل سوف يولد سوف يولد حروب بأشكال مختلفة مختلفة عندما يكون اليمن حاليا 30 مليون شخص بعد 10 20 سنة 10 و 20 سنة تكون 50 مليون نمو اقتصادي 1-2% هل هذا هل هذا فشل أو هل هذا نجاح؟ نفس القصة أفغانستان أفغانستان تم الحديث عنها عنها أو ذكرها أفغانستان ممكن نشوف من بداية تدخل الأمريكي كان عدد الأفغان 20 مليون الآن 40 مليون في 20 سنة 
كم كان حجم النمو الاقتصادي؟ 2 3% في بعض الاحيان في الفتره الماضيه، هل هذا نجاح اقتصادي اقتصادي لامريكا؟ هل امريكا قدمت يعني طفره اقتصاديه لافغانستان زي ما بعض الاحيان خاصه في الاعلام الغربي الفكره سائده؟ هذا 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 يعني حجم المشاكل مختلف تماما حاليا. شكرا شكرا جزيلا دكتور طبعا قبل ان احيل الكلمه الى الزميل العزيز دكتور مهند الاثار اثار الحروب والنزاعات اثار خطيره جدا وكبيره هناك مؤخرا صدرت بعض الابحاث تربط بين على المستوى الماكرو بين تراجع مؤشرات التنميه بشكل اساسي في عدد من الدول العربيه التي اصيبت طبعا باشكاليه الحروب الاهليه تراجع تلك المؤشرات الى الوراء مما يعقد طبعا مساله اعاده الاعمار. الامر الثاني اكثر من دراسه صدرت مؤخرا تربط بين الفساد ومراحل ما بعد النزاع كجزء من التداعيات. الموضوع طبعا طويل يعني لكن طبعا هذه اطلاله مهمه جدا من من المحاضرين الذين افادونا بما قدموا دكتور مهند الكلمه لك تفضل شكرا دكتور عبد الفتاح وشكر موصول ايضا لكل الاخوه اللي قدموا اوراق وزملاء وكانت اوراق ممتعه وغنيه بالمعلومات سؤالي للزميل الدكتور محمد السعيدي Um, and I will switch to English now. Um, so you mentioned that the the region, the Middle East region, I assume you meant, it's the most dammed in the in the world. So there's so many dams in in the area, and you know, to to and you you predicted also that the scarcity of water could be a catalyst for or a cause for uh, of um, future conflicts. Do you think? And I, I'm I'm not sure if you are looking into that in, in within this particular paper, but I, I want to pick your uh, brain on this. Do, do you think that the existing mechanisms under the international law are enough to regulate conflict, um, uh, interstate conflict, um, in terms of um, managing the shares of water when it comes to rivers? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Mohanad. Uh, actually, we have, we have uh, Current work with uh, with you, the Doha Center, and uh, to really look at this within a special edition. I hope it will come next year. So, um, on transboundary water management and really conflict resolution. Sometimes we talk about water diplomacy, right? So, to your question, uh, the international law is not very specific how you achieve cooperation. The international law has three principles, basically. It says if you have shared water uh, and every country has the right to develop it, but if you develop um, water, you should prior, uh, prior, priorly notif not notify the other prior notification, equitable util utilization, and no harm. These are the three principles. But if you look at the legacies of uh, water cooperation, uh, they are positive. So. Cooperation, if you if you take at the human look at the human history, cooperation is the norm, not conflict. So conflict is a new phenomenon that uh, is due to increased uh, population, increasing economies. We see it in the Nile, we see it in the uh, Ephorat and Tigris, we see it in many transboundary water basins. Um, so the common the common academic view is that this will not lead to interstate war because this is a self mutual destruction everybody has dams you can just boom by the other the other person dams but it will uh, it, it can be solved uh, through inter international law is one mechanism but through really diplomacy especially water diplomacy and really showcasing that by cooperation you can share the benefits and not share the river we should share the benefits from the from the rivers and not concentrate on the water flow of course I'm not going into details. Every case is very specific. Every transboundary case is very specific because it is a part of the politics uh, and the international relations in this space. In fact, شكرا شكرا جزيلا دكتور محمد السعيدي طبعا 
الشكر موصول للدكتور السعيدي and our thanks to all our panelists and speakers and I must not forget Dr. Omar Ashur and his team at the strategic, strategic Studies Unit and the technical team of the Arab Center. Thank you all for this session. We have a following session, which will be on uh, comparative successes, failures, and stalemates. I give the floor now to Dr. Omar Ashur. Thank you. Thank you very much, all our panelists and presenters, and our thanks to Dr. Abdel Fattah for his wise moderation. And there was Yemeni, Yemeni cooperation because they coordinated well and cooperated well. This was wonderful. Now we will close this panel and we come back at 3.15 for the seventh panel entitled Comparative Successes, Failures and Stalemates and uh, in the Civil Wars. We will have Dr. David Darish Chavilli on the Georgian case, uh, Lucas Stretch, he'll talk about uh, and, uh, uh, Serbia and Western Balkans. Dr. Ali Luheshi will present on the Libyan civil war. Dr. Mansour Lakhdari on the Algerian experience in ending the civil war. Thank you all and may the blessings of God be upon you all. Thanks.